welcome. Uh, can uh, you tell me if you can hear me in the chat, please? And see the slides. Cool, because Leroy is the co the co-trainer, so it's cool that you can hear me, but I'm not sure. <laughs> can you can you answer in the chat I if you can hear, hear me? You, oh, you can't hear me. That's funny. Maybe that's me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's me probably. Okay. Go ahead. If you can hear me, if you can hear me, put a, put a yes in the chat. And no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, okay. yeah, that was only me. <laughs> Okay. All right, let's get started then. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, today we're going to talk about how to secure the impact of your consulting projects. This is part of a series of webinars that we have launched around how to maximize the ROI of your consulting. And uh, the previous episode uh, two months ago was about uh, how to buy better and um, uh, keep your cost under control, which is pretty much the uh, the same coin, another face. Uh, what I mean by that is when you talk about ROI, you have value and cost, obviously, uh, and impact and cost, and obviously the two work together. Um, but the, the very difference is that the people that can um, affect the impact and affect the cost are not really the same people. That's why we separated them, them too. All right, so that was pretty much it. So let's get started. Just a bit of ground rules. Um, we, you have access to uh, the handouts. These are the slides. You can download them, the slide here in a PDF version, whenever you want. And uh, if you have questions, please ask them either in the questions um, uh, section in, in the left hand of your screen or the chats. Uh, we will make our best to answer them during uh, the presentation. So just when you have a question, just ask it and we'll make, uh, we'll do our best to answer it. Okay. Let's go. Let's get started. Laurent, are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay. Let's go. So just to kind of give you a little bit of, of context for those of you who don't know us, Laurent and I are the co-founders of a company called Consulting Quest that is specialized in how to buy consulting services. So that's the easy part. Um, I would say that I'm more of the consulting procurement uh, expert and Laurent is more of the um, digital uh, and SaaS expert in that sense. Uh, I won't spend too much time on, on our profile. You can have a look on, uh, on LinkedIn and see what we've done. I think that's pretty telling. That's it. I, I wanted to start with... Uh, a quote, I always start with a quote. I like this one. Value is not what you get. It's ultimately what you do with what you get that matters. And I think this is pretty much what we're trying to, we're trying to convey today that value in consulting is uh, tricky. And it's a, it's a very important part of uh, getting um, the best out of your ROI. It's, a, it's an important part also of the procurement process. And the problem is that it's not often in the hands of procurement. So the, the internal stakeholders, the clients, the users, whatever you call them, are the ones that have probably uh, the levers to, to make that better. But there are things that we can do to facilitate the, the value and to make sure that it's, it's maximized. But that's what we're going to talk about today. So... We're going through a couple of items that we think are the, the levers to really get the most value out of your consulting project. The first one seems obvious, <laughs> like work on the right project, on the right setup and the right, with the right consultants. I think that's, that's uh, a lot of right, but that's exactly what it is. It's uh, when you want to have the impact, um, then you need to work with the right people and uh, in with um, the right amount of consultants, I would say, but we'll go into deeper into that. Then the next step is focusing on the right areas to maximize impact. We'll go over on that. We're talking here about scoping, as you can imagine. Um, the third part is uh, collaboration. Uh, you need collaboration between your consultants and your internal teams in order to 
a project to succeed. So that's pretty also obvious, but I know the, our experience tells us that it's not always put in place. Um, project management is another overlooked lever. Um, projects have to be managed, even though there are consultants that are driving them. There is still a need for an internal team to be there and drive the project in and everything that it means. And we'll go over that. And finally, um, <laughs> how to leverage um, pricing structures, <laughs> right? And again, we go, we'll go through quickly through that and explain what can be done, but also what are the pitfalls and, um, and the limitations of such systems, right? Mm -hmm. So we'll get started with the right one, which is working on the right project with the right setup and the right consultant. So here I'm not, we're not talking about demand management. Um, this is something that we'll cover in another webinar. Um, we're talking about at project level. It's um, what project should you work on with what team and if you decide to, ex to, to outsource what consultants, more or less. Mm -hmm. And so the, the first thing, I think it's, 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 again, something that is often overlooked is that... So you assume... You you assume, just to, just to precise what you just said, you assume yes. that the decision to work on the project has been taken. So it's yes. not anymore about shall we work on this or not. It's more about the how we're going to work on this uh, on this project. Will it be internally, externally, with whom, and, and so on, correct? Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly that. Yeah. So, uh, and and the first, the first step here, and I know it sounds uh, a little bit, of course, um, but the truth is, it's not always um, put on the table. Uh, it's that, can I outsource that project? And um, the, in order to outsource a project, you need to have uh, a project that has boundaries, that have deliverable, that you're able to define, that have a deadline, something that can really help you draw the scope of your project. That's kind of the first thing. The second thing is the complexity of the project. Um, it's really hard to outsource a project when there are a lot of interdependencies with other activities, other projects, other initiatives that are going on in the, in the company um, because the, the consultants needs to have some um, independence to roll out the project. And if you don't, then you might be, you might have at some point, your consultants that are idle because they're they're waiting for inputs or the other way around, and this is not necessarily um, good in terms of value creation. And that's also a an, an, an very important part of it. And I know it's tough to say, oh, we have a project that is completely independent. That's very rare, but we have to think about how to make it as independent as possible. And, and the, the, the key, question, the key yeah. question on this is the accountability. Yeah. Because if you have interdependencies, then you provide excuses to everyone for not delivering. And uh, that's something, that's a, the type of conversation you want to avoid. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that, that's also a good point. And the last part is availability of the resources. So here, um, are there people <laughs> that can deliver literally? Is it? something that exists? Is it as capability or a type of project that is really a thing? And um, that's also something that can be hard to evaluate uh, at the beginning of a project, but that's also something that we should, we should think about. Mm -hmm. So the, the second step, and that's where we enter our uh, make or buy analysis with a tiny bit of strategic value, because, you know, this, you'd still need to think about it is that now my project is something that I can outsource. Indeed, it has, it's good enough. And, and then I can hire consultants. Um, but why are hiring consultants? What's the value you're expecting from outsourcing that project? And will the fact that you outsource the project make it go faster, higher, uh, create more value that if you were doing that internally and and also are there pretend like on the on the downsides are there potential risk of 
outsourcing that project that can be linked to conflict of interest, that can be um, confidentiality, intellectual property, um, and, and also budget-wise, can you afford outsourcing that project? All of this you have to think about before you're, you, uh, you start a project. For instance, we, we worked a couple of years ago with the, uh, the, the French transportation company, the French, uh, the, the most famous one, the SNCF, and uh, they, they had created an entire uh, internal consulting group, first to address the cost, because they could take uh, on board uh, uh, some of the projects uh, without having to pay the cost of consultants, because it was kind of a 50% factor between the two, but also because there were several topics linked to the evolution of the regulation at European level and activities that would be externalized or these kind of things that could have had a very sensitive effect uh, on the, um, from a social standpoint that they wanted to keep close to the vest. And they had in mind that uh, by, by using external folks, they were placing themselves at risk and they wanted to keep that internally. Yeah, indeed. And then... There's the ideal delivery model. So here we have a consulting value chain that is diversifying very quickly. We have many, many new business models that are emerging. We have, uh, we have consulting marketplaces. We have access to uh, small boutiques, to, to freelancers, to market research directly, to experts on demand, all of this make the offering much more diverse than it was maybe 20 years ago. And, and that, that also means that depending on your needs and your skills and capabilities and availabilities internally, you might consider a different delivery model. And so let me give you an example. Um, last year, I interviewed two uh, companies I interviewed strategy leaders from two companies and they had a very different setup for the same type of project. In one of the companies, they had a, um, a strategy group that was made mainly of former strategy consultants. They've been through um, mostly the MBB or the big four. They had a lot of experience in strategy and the leader told me that he would not hire consultants for the full strategy cycle or for, or for a full strategy project. He will just hire them on very specific part, either when they didn't have the skills or the knowledge of the market or when they were overwhelmed and they, they, had, they needed some extra help on, on, on some part of the process. So that's typically uh, a mix between internal and external um, resources. Well, at the same time, I discussed with another strategy leader and in his company, the, the strategy group was made of high potentials that were picked in all the different business units and all the different functions of the company, meaning that they had very rarely a strategy or consulting background. And in that case, they were hiring consultants to really help them, uh, you know, develop methodology, transfer knowledge on strategy and et cetera. So you see two different companies, pretty similar in terms of size and, and revenues and so on, but two complete different approach to, to their projects. And indeed, the needs that are different and a delivery model that cannot be the same. So this is what we're talking about. And, and there, that was, there would be a third case where a company would have a strategy, a strategy uh, capabilities in their internal consulting groups and they could consider working with um, the internal consulting group. So the idea here is that there are many, many options and um, you have to consider when you launch a project, what option is the best in terms of alignment with your needs of value creation of benefits from each of those models of cost, uh, of course, but also of challenges. And then, of course, <laughs> we are going to think about what are the right consultants. And here I'll, I'll come squeezing again um, what, what we call the, the consulting DNA. It's, it's a way to describe the consultants and show um, the complexity of the, of the consulting market. 
it's not only about capabilities in industry. People just say, okay, this is a strategic consultant and he works for, I don't know, the uh, the automotive industry, good enough. Well, <laughs> this is a bit more complex than that. There's so many things that you could consider. Uh, of course, the industry experience and the capabilities are core. That's really the first thing that you need to think about. But the footprint is also something very important. And in, in, in our days where we're trying to reduce the cost and reduce travel, that could be important. But more than that, it can be about culture, about language, about the ability to be on premises. Um, that's also the size of the company. Um, some companies that are very small cannot um, embark on very, very large company-wide projects because they're too small. That's it. Then there's the delivery model, which is more about uh, how they do the work. Um, are they hard or soft um, approach? Do Are they hands-on or are they more, I'm, I'm working with you on the side and I'm teaching you how to do things? So all of this can impact the way they work. And it, it's it's very important to understand what the needs what needs you have. You have the credibility also, which is usually built on you know the brand, of course, but also the thought leadership, um, the you know the the, um, the founders in small companies. That's going to be about the background of the founders and of the consultants, etc. So the idea all is really the, all, the, all the relationships, because it could be uh, uh, that you want to work with someone because he's very well connected with someone else. And, sure. uh, and build a relationship on this or think that by working on this with this person, it may influence another outcome. So the, the who knows who is, is also a very important topic in consulting. Absolutely. And, and, and when you launch a project, actually, you can more or less start building that idea profile that you're looking for. And then and then once you, you start searching for consulting firms, probably first in your panel and then, uh, you know, if you don't find what you're looking for in your panel, you can go on, on the marketplace. And then you need to, to compare what you have in your ideal profile and what's the reality of that company. And what is really hard is that unless you know them, really, it's difficult to say if there's really a fit. And that's where, mm -hmm. you know, checking references, analyzing case studies can really help to get more insight into what they can do, really. There is a strand of the DNA that seems to be available here. I think we, we should add something about diversity because we see mm -hmm. this being uh, more and more part of the selection criteria to be working with uh, woman-owned or veteran-owned uh, companies, uh, especially uh, on the on the U.S. side uh, of the Atlantic. Uh, that, yeah. that's something that is uh, that is becoming prevalent. Yeah, that's a very good point. And and the last part is evaluate performance. So here. You may think, why are you saying that? It's, it's, I'm going back to what I said before on you need to check in your panel. So you have a panel of consulting firms, but unless you evaluate performance systematically, then you don't really know if they're good or not. Meaning that you don't really know if you have high performers and low performers in your panel. And ideally, you should only have high performers. And if, they, if you have ones that are not... Um, you know, satisfying the needs of your clients, then you should replace them. So that's also part of how you can contribute to really make sure that your internal stakeholders always have access to the right consultants for a project. So how can you can can we enable those make or buy decisions? So the first part is. Um, helping to build the, 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 the decision matrix, right? And making sure that the process is objective and thorough. So that's, also, that's a very important point. The second point is um, the, the, the market exploration. Exploring the market and understanding what are the different options, um, consulting firms, expert networks, marketplace, I'm understanding the pros and cons, and defining what are the ones that make sense for your company and your organization as a whole, very high level, and give those options to, to your, your internal clients. The, the third part is vendor evaluation. It's going back to 
Uh, it's a mix between, um, you know, checking references and, and evaluating performance, but that's really key to understand who are those consultants, what can they do, are they a good fit for us, uh, do we need their skills now and in the future. And the last part that we don't often talk about, um, it's, it's risk mitigation. Obviously, um, this is part also of, of the considerations when you decide to work or not with um, a consultant is, is it, is the risk versus benefits uh, in, um, favorable, right? Are we, are we fine? Do we, do we have risk at the lowest level possible when we work with, externally with those consultants? And I'm thinking about, of course, IP and confidentiality, for instance, or data information, anything that can be that can be uh, put into that in that um, risk, you know, bucket. So that's it for this one. Now we're going to focus on the on the second lever, which is focusing on the right area to maximize impact. So here, I'm going back to something that was I said before: is that the ROI is value over cost, right? And today we are talking about. The higher part we're talking about value the thing is when when the project you do are very broad in terms of scope then the value you get is high but the value versus cost is may, may not be the highest that you can get um so the idea here is that in order to get really the highest roi for your consulting project you need to think about what are those must have the things that have strategically aligned that will create a um, high value. These are the ones that you should focus on. And this is particularly true because we all know that we don't have unlimited budgets, right? We have to to play within within that, that envelope. And, and that's where that becomes a very important, um, a very important part of the of the work here right and uh, when you look at this uh it, it's a uh, it's a very simple equation but uh you you can think in terms of uh, negotiation and in terms of value uh where your priorities should be uh, I, i'll give you just two examples if you own a project that has some value but not much that is an enabler on a commodity uh, type of consulting and uh, the delta in terms of value is not significant, the cost will be extremely important because you want to optimize that because it's a commodity and uh, you, you want to really stretch the, the, the cost part. Uh, if you're looking at a project where indeed you can, let's say, multiply, well, get additional, a couple of additional millions by just uh, saving a couple of months on the project, then the value becomes so much more important than the cost. I'm not saying that we should not optimize the cost. The cost should be fair. But at the end of the day, what really matters is the impact and making sure that you're working with a firm that will get you the result that you want because the, the multiple between the value and the cost uh, will be such that the, the impact will, will justify pretty much anything that happens in the negotiation. Hmm. True. So, so I, I mentioned briefly the must-have. Uh, I think this is kind of a key uh, concept uh, when when we work uh, on consulting and uh, on consulting project. It's again budgets are not unlimited, so we need to focus on what's the most important and what we really need, what will bring more value. And so you of course start with defining what are those must-haves that the ones that you know, those elements, those deliverables or those milestones in your project that you absolutely need for that project or that initiative. That's kind of their first step. Then you need to prioritize them. And all of them don't have the same value or the same urgency. And you just need to kind of identify which ones are more important than others. And then that comes to the time for the tough decisions, which are where do you, you know, where do you draw the line? What are the ones that stay in the scope and the one that cannot stay in the scope because we, you don't have the, the budget. Sometimes you will, and that means that you need to renegotiate with your top leadership, the budget maybe. Um, but sometimes it means that you have to, to, to change the scope in order to, 
uh, adapt to the budget that you have. Mm -hmm. And so where does that happen most of the time? There are two phases where it can happen. The first one is at the RFP phase, when you can start already challenging uh, the content of the of the RFP and, and of the scope to make sure that it is indeed a must have and you really need that. It's really so important that we cannot do without it. That's the first part, that's the first place where you, you can, uh, you know, act on those on those must have. And the second part is on in, during the negotiation phase. And here, I wouldn't say it's a bit too late, but it's a bit harder <laughs> to get back to you cut some part of the project and some part of the scope. And, and, and that's particularly true when you end up with a proposal that is way, way over uh, your budget. And, um, they, and, and you know, when, when you work on, on those, you have typically two type of approaches. One is the most common that's needs-based approach. And is that you talk from your needs and you say, um, this is what I want. And then I estimate um, the, require, the, the cost, and then I cut some of the requirements. That's kind of the way you do, you start with the needs. And then there's another approach that is extremely efficient, especially uh, when you uh, have a much smaller budget than, than, uh, than what you, you would like to do. Then you start with a budget, and then you're trying to define what are the must have that fit into that budget. So it's kind of the other way to do thing, to do this, right? I would have two comments on this. The first one is that on the, the content of a project from a scope standpoint, sometimes the negotiation is not with the consultants. Sometimes the negotiation is with internally with the executives that are specifying the work because they, they are like, uh, excuse my uh, image, but like a kid in a candy shop. Uh, the more they can get, the better. So uh, they have the opportunity to have a project with a very well-known consultant and they want to get as much information as they can. But uh, the more you ask, the more they need to work, the more they need to work, the more it adds up in terms of cost. And if indeed you need to analyze only half of the market because that's where the value is, that's where you have a right to play, uh, you don't need to analyze the other half. Yes, but just in case there is something in the other half, yeah, but it's going to be the same cost to analyze the part where we know that there is probably nothing, then to analyze the, the part that is really important to us. And having this dialogue is, is something that's important that and that we have on a regular basis when we are mandating on, on projects. That That's one. And the second one on the design to cost is that, yes, you don't want necessarily to give your target cost to the consultant at the beginning because you want to them to uh, kind of feel the pressure of the costing and so on. But when you are stretched in terms of budget and you want to maximize what you get for what you can afford, this method is rather efficient because it, it, it avoids uh, having a consultant that comes back with a proposal that is at three times your budget and then you need to negotiate and discope and so on. The, the consultants usually are rather smart. And if you tell them, I can only afford 300K or I can only afford 1 million, let's discuss and optimize what can be done with this amount. They, they will come with, uh, with, with innovative ways to, to, to make it work. Or they will say it's not possible. But in 90% uh, in of the cases, they come back with uh, options that, that can make things work. Yeah, and, and, and um, even the, the big consulting firms, it's not limited to smaller ones, right? Yeah. So how do we uh, facilitate those smarter investments? The first part is how we can help estimate the cost at the beginning in order to give some um, inputs into that first conversation on, on um, you know, estimating the cost of the budget based on the, the initial scope. Uh, the second way is to also, especially when you don't have a clear scope in mind or you are wondering about the feasibility of a given project, um, for instance, you're trying to uh, transpose um, a methodology from another industry into your industry and has never done before or so you think, then that's where it's interesting to talk to consultants um, ahead of the RFP process and, and discuss with them to understand uh, what they can do, um, what requirements would make sense. And also, it's a good way to establish relationship if you don't know them yet. So that's another we way. Had, yeah. we, just had the, we just had the case 
uh, on one of our projects where indeed we decided to start with a, an RFI phase. Uh, the, the client wanted to discuss mostly with, uh, with blue chip uh, MBB type uh, consultants. And uh, we were not sure whether they would be on board with an RFI that was not kind of a guarantee to have an RFP after or that the budget would be there after. And uh, out of the, the, the four top consultancies that we have contacted, uh, everyone accepted a meeting and only one dropped in the process uh, explaining that they were short in resources, which was a kind of an excuse to say that they were not interested. Uh, but asking us to keep them in mind on the day it would become an RFP, which is kind of, yeah, my friend, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes, I will remember you, but not in the way you think. But that's another, uh, that's that's another, another question. <laughs> all, this, all, this to, all this to say that uh, it, it doesn't hurt to have uh, exploratory discussion and that it's even recommended. Yeah, and then they also help to write RFPs. Um, it's it's an expertise to write an RFP in in a very uh, structured way. There are there are things here that are specifically linked to the type of things that we buy here at consulting, but there are also elements that are very important in terms of information for the consulting supplier, so they can really judge if that's interesting for them to get into that project. And uh, that's just a fair game to, to explain that to them very clearly. Uh, this, the other thing is challenging the mass halves. Uh, I think that you, even though you're not a specialist in, in strategy or specialist in operation, you can always play the facilitation role and say, do we really need that? Is that very necessary? To what extent can we do this? Uh, do that align with our objectives and so on? And I think that's a very important role that is hard to take on, I, I would say. It's specifically on consulting because we, procurement is often sidelined, right? Um, but that's some, that, that brings a lot of value. And the last part is making sure that they're value for money. Yeah, go ahead. Now, on the challenging the must have, it's not necessarily <coughs> the consultant. Uh, no, the, the procurement that, that should do mm -hmm. that. Uh, if I look back at what I was doing when I was running strategy and I was owning indeed yes. the budget, I was owning the budget for the entire business unit. Uh, I was not kind of uh, defining all the consulting projects, but I was playing a kind of a check and balance role, discussing with the guys. So do, do you need to have all those kind of best practice analysis? Do you need to analyze the 10 plans uh, to come up with uh, some recommendations in terms of what we want to do in terms of machine learning, uh, et cetera, et cetera? It can be done by... Uh, the, the procurement folks, but it can be done also by the people that have a vested interest in the transformation or that are owning the budgets. Even finance can play this kind of role. So it's not limited to the, the procurement function, I would say. Yeah, I agree. So now we're, we're going to talk about collaboration. So I think that to, to go back to kind of the principles, it's very important to be very clear on what are the objectives the deliverables and the key performance indicators and um, have a common understanding between the stakeholders and the consultants of what is expected. And, and that means also putting as much as possible of that into the, the consulting agreement. Uh, it has to be very clear, timelines, responsibilities, deliverables, um, this, this is how you really kind of make sure that everyone is on the same page at the beginning of the project and, and, and moving forward, right? And um, also the one <laughs> very important part, and we kind of touched upon that, it's, it's to align expectations. Um, one thing that is probably a killer for any consulting project is when among the internal stakeholders, not everyone has um, the same expectations out of the project. And then that means not everyone will be rowing in the, right, in the same direction. And that's how you can literally wreck a project. So it's really important to make sure that the collaboration is there with the, between the consultants and the stakeholders, but also between the different stakeholders and the one that own the budget and our project managers, and also the ones that will be impacted by the project, but are now leading the project per se. That, that's a very important part, right? And how do you do that? Like, I think this is pretty obvious, but uh, you need to be candid and, and regularly uh, discuss with everyone, make sure that everyone is still aligned along the project, especially when projects are long, right? 
Um, then have regular updates on, you know, the progress, the challenges, the milestones. And the last part is, of course, every time you have a conflict that is rising, then making sure that you're taking the time to to resolve them and 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 make sure that that won't happen again. So that's and that's a good one, one important point is that it may sound counterintuitive, but it's not because you see each other every day that mm -hmm. you're actually discussing about the collaboration. Because you, you might be discussing about the content, but not about the soft part of things or whether you're happy with the progress or happy with the, the way things are happening because you're busy preparing a presentation and you're working on kind of uh, facts and, and preparing uh, the next meeting or debriefing from the previous meeting. Uh, everything that's done in the machine uh, is not really about how the machine is working or whether the machine is doing the right thing. Yeah. And then there's also an important element is that um, you, it's, you're responsible for putting the consultant in, in the right position to deliver. Uh, there's a lot that can be do, done sorry, by, by um, the clients in order to make sure that the consultants will deliver. The, the first part is about the buying. And I mean, um, the consultants, they can, of course, reach out to the different people. But if they're backed by um, the top leadership and, and um, the key people in the organization, that they will be much more successful in, in getting that um, you know, on track. The second part is resource availability. So most consulting projects work with some um, implication of the, the internal teams. And those people that were uh, ha the, the, that workload, that, that availability, those resources that the consultant counted on when they make their proposals, they need to be available during the project so they can really come on them and, and deliver. So this also, which, sorry? So which pretty much comes back to item number one, which means that if you don't have the buy-in of the top management and the leadership team, they will not free their resources and, uh, and then it becomes yeah. difficult to progress. Of course, I, I, also, have enough, yeah. I, have, I have enough scars to, to, to testify about that one. If you don't align properly your peers and uh, the key stakeholders, then uh, you, you waste uh, half of the money from your consulting project, if not more. Yeah, and also a dedicated project management. You need to have someone in charge of the project. You cannot just let the consultant go and do that stuff. Uh, if you want to uh, make sure that things are happening and, and that are... You know, um, in line with what you had in mind when you when you sign on the contract, you need to have someone here that is uh, on a daily contact for that for that for those consultants. And uh, I, was um, say, I was tempted to say that even if it's a study and recommend project where they have to bring an outside in expertise and uh, mm -hmm. uh, get provide information in a rather autonomous way, you need to make sure that they're answering to the right question. They need to make sure that the, the segmentation that they are using is right, that the questions they're asking are making sense for your organization. So yeah. even some project that would seem pretty distant requires someone to, to oversee the work that is being done. And uh, uh, if you don't manage the consultants, then you get the results you deserve. Absolutely. And, and of course, there's the continual, you know, stakeholder engagement. It means that you can have the buying at the beginning of the project, yeah, but you need to make sure that as the project moves forward, things are still going well and, and stakeholders are still aligned and, and, um, and that the consultants can have the right information to, to deliver uh, the desired outcomes. So how do you do that? Uh, first, um, a, that's that's change management, right? But um, in, you know, involving the key stakeholders at the beginning of the decision making making process. And what I mean by that is when you start defining the needs. I'm not saying all the stakeholders, all the ones that are impacted, but at least the main ones. Being involved at the very beginning, helping a hand in writing the RFP and scoping the project, in selecting the consulting firms, in evaluating the proposals, it's very, very powerful to 
get everybody on the same page, everybody aligned, and everybody happy with the selection. Because we've seen in the past, you know, some of the stakeholders that uh, had to deal with a consultant that they didn't choose, even though the project was impacting their 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 uh, activity um, in a very um, you know important way, and that rarely ends well. You, I'm sure you have experience in that, Lauren. You have uh, you know some examples about you know that part and or, no, or... The, the, typical, the typical example is the the it function working on its uh, future blueprint or future implementation by function and uh, not discussing with the business leaders within the business unit about what they want in terms of uh, crm or uh, business intelligence tools and so on and of course if you don't involve them in uh, the fact that you're working on this and you don't get them a seat at the table uh, your consultants will make a nice report, but uh, you will be in trouble when the time comes to, to implement it. Unless it's a very kind of top-down model uh, governance in the organization, which is rarely the case. The second part is clarifying the workload at the beginning. As I said, um, the, the consultants usually count on some participation of your teams in the work uh, down the line. And you can absolutely ask them to clarify how much they expect from you to deliver. And that's also a very good way to make sure that these expectations are realistic and that you'll be able to supervise this project, but also contribute to that. And, um, and that's also sometimes a, a criterion for choice uh, when you select the, the, the proposal. And the last part is um, you know, defining what's the project management structure and I'm thinking about the two things, which are the daily ma project management team, but also the steering committee. And we'll talk a bit longer about that. But these are things that can, should be described in the proposals and then in the SOW as well. Mm -hmm. So now project management, right? So as we said before, you manage a project, just like you manage an internal project, you manage a project with consultants. And that means three things. It means managing your stakeholders. It means uh, managing the project itself. And also, it means managing change. And all of this is on the shoulders of the project manager and the project sponsor. So how does it work? The first part is the steering committee. So the steering committee is more or less the instance where you will make the key decisions and 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 uh, uh, during the project, uh, decide if the deliverables are valid. Decide if you want to move to phase two uh, on this project. If you're ready to present to the executive committee or things like that. So it's very important instance, and it's usually made of um, the project sponsors, some main stakeholders, where the project manager will present with the support of the consultants often. Then there's another instance, which is more or less the heart of the project, which is the working team. So the working team is made, of course, of a mix of client and consultants. Uh, and this role is to make sure that the project is going smoothly. It's mostly, um, you know, daily project activities, um, decisions on, you know, the tasks and the, um, the, the allocations of, of resources and stuff like that. That, that team, um, meets frequently, it can be weekly or be weekly very often. And, and then it's a blend between, you know, consultants and, and uh, clients. That's a very important part of the project. Now, <laughs> we wanted to add a, a, another slide on that because truth be to be told, right? We've seen cases where the project were not managed. Uh, we bought a project, the project sponsor did it. Um, they had a project manager that didn't have a lot of time on his hands. And actually the consultants were just doing whatever they could with what they were given and with the as little instruction that they got. And it's it's it was a loss for both sides, right? Everybody has the, the losing uh, 
on the losing end of the stick right now. So that's why having a dedicated project manager, someone who has enough time to handle that project, hence, you know, identifying what the workload expected from the project manager and so on, that could be very helpful to choose who's the right person to manage this project, making sure that they're responsible for the goals and the deliverables, that they are accountable as well. That's very important. Having also, yeah. Knowing that the person that is embodying the project might not be the day-to-day -day project manager. Uh, you can have, uh, for instance, a strategy project uh, that will be, of course, uh, on the shoulder of the head of strategy, but the head of strategy is involved in many, many things. And uh, he usually has a kind of a senior deputy or something like that that can work on the project on a day-to-day -day basis with the consultants and provide guidance and only escalate the topics that are important. But having this day-to-day -day contact and having someone that can provide guidance and facilitate connections and so on is, is extremely important. And if we don't have that, then uh, you, you, you may lose a lot of time and a lot of kind of uh, content uh, because the consultants will be missing the context also. That's no, true. And, and then you have, of course, adequate resources and it's the time, the skills, but also the authority, you know, to, to be able to decide and not having to go through hoops to get things approved. And then we go back to change management. Of course, very often consultants um, include change management into their proposal, but there's some part of that that has to be started before even the project is there is launched. Mm -hmm. And and so the project manager here has a real responsibility to make sure that this is really going on and the consultants are really contributing to that. But there are some parts that still stay on in the risk of the uh, in the hands of the project manager, right? <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, we're gonna get there at the end. Uh, <laughs> it's the end of the day. Let's say that. Um, and and finally, managing the relationship. This is very important, and uh, it's crucial to make sure that uh, the relationship is based on trust, transparency, and, and open communication. So document the changes. That's probably one of the most overlooked parts of of the work. Um, it's it's super important when you have a change in scope, in price, uh, in staffing, that is really important. You need to document that change. And, and ideally, if this really a big change, you should have um, an, an adjustment of the, of the contract. Right, so that that sounds like nothing. That's super important. And the thing is, and I'll give you an example, a real life example. I had a client a couple of years ago who was working with a consultant, and he had in mind a certain scope. But during the project, neither the neither the consultant nor the the the, the client, um, you know, documented the change. And at the end of the um, of the project. Uh, the client where was not happy with the price that was remitted because the consultants were saying, hey, you did, you made me so much more than the initial scope Then I had to increase the price by 20%. And the client said, no, I didn't do that. I don't want to pay. And there was like stuck into that. And you have to look at everything, go back to the initial proposal, go look at every single deliverable to see if that deliverable was indeed. There was a nightmare as if they had documented the change on the client side what the, the change in the scope and on the on the consultant side how it would impact the final cost then that would have been solved before and there would have even been even been a problem right because they would have decided to go or not but the, so the other learning is also to avoid as much as possible to sign time and material projects for consultant well that's another story <laughs> but that was that, that's just part of that problem. I think that the problem was deeper than that. Uh, second thing is uh, uh, having a meet assignment review, especially when you're in a very long project. That's a very good way to uh, make sure that you're still online, that uh, the objective of, or, or are still um, you know, um, clear for everyone. And if, especially if they change, because on long-term projects, things can change along the way and ensuring that the project is on track and that the consultants can have some uh, feedback on what is happening and and, uh, and and you know pointers to improve their relationship, improve the way they they work with your team. So that's uh, also very important. 
And the last part is having very good relationships with the consulting firms, you know, to make sure that once a problem arrives, then they know who to turn to, or they'll be willing to, because they know they had good relationship with you and they have visibility and, and they have opportunities. This is very important in order to, to make sure that your project um, are, are going well. Mm -hmm. And so here, you know, what the four elements that that can be done first it's on the governance again defining the governance who is doing what in the different groups what responsibilities they have and what frequency they will meet and and um what is that outcome is expected of those of those different instances that's that's very that's really key uh, the second part is on contract management either at the beginning uh, when signing the contract but also later on to uh, manage the contract, managing the change, resolving the potential um, conflicts, and so on. The third one is performance assessment. Um, it's really key to to uh, build a good relationship with the consultants, and actually, they they like to hear <laughs> performance reviews and feedback about their performance because they really have access to that, and it's really hard to. Uh, to engage in continuous improvement if you don't have feedback from your clients. So that's very important um, to, to do, and they'll be very interested in learning about that. If, if, and it goes also with, I'm not very happy with the performance of X and Y. Can we do something about it in the particular and long project? You can absolutely engage in those conversations with them and make sure that um, you get the best out of them. Uh, feet is not, it's not your fault, it's not their fault. Sometimes there's just... There's no fit between people and that can impact the, the performance of a project. And you, you have to be very clear and transparent about that and not wait until the end and say, ah, oh, that was that was not happy. Uh, if it's really important and the project is long, then do it. Do it very uh, early on and, and put that on the table and uh, and get that resolved. And finally, uh, what we said, relationship management, which is also a very important part and where really procurement has a role to play in building the relationship, build, building relationships that are not only personal, because there is some trust building and some personal relationship between the consultants and the partners and the, the clients, the internal stakeholders, but there also need to be some relationship uh, between company A and company B in order to build that relationship and, and, and make sure that the relationship continues after uh, the people are gone. And then finally, last part is about pricing, effective pricing. So um, I just did a little bit of, you know, uh, reminder on how uh, consulting fees are structured. It's usually based on the workload. You multiply by the daily rate. That daily rate uh, takes into account the level of security and the expertise of the consultants. And you have to um, and then there's uh, a margin also that covers the overhead calls to task, commercial efforts, marketing, and so on. Just for the record, uh, when you take a partner in a consulting firm, they usually spend more, more than 50% of their time in commercial work. Um, so it, it, it's not, it's not a, a, um, unusual to see that uh, you have a, a, a significant margin to 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 the cost uh, in the in the price uh, structure. So the most common are time and material. This is a pretty simple one. Yeah. What what you should anticipate is a, a, yeah. an occupation rate of juniors that will be between one hundred and eighty and two hundred days. Mm -hmm. Then for the for the managers around one hundred and fifty and for the partners around one hundred days which mm -hmm. means that 100 days of the year, they are not billable. But they need to be paid <laughs> or to pay themselves, which means that they need to, to charge it when they are billable, which is kind of pushing the, the billable rates uh, significantly up. Yeah, absolutely. And, and then there are three types of, of, of um, the most common fee structure. The first one is timing materials. This is the hourly, hourly or daily um, fees. Uh, you pay for what they do. Um, this is a risky model uh, for clients because they they um, they have most of the risks uh, because if the if the project takes longer than expected then they'll have to pay no matter what 
And so that's why you absolutely need to consider how to solve cap on, on consulting project. It's really ma management consulting project is not necessarily the best option um, unless it's a very small project or the scope is really hard to define. And then you have to go through um, something that is very flexible. Um, fix or flag fee, that's the most common. Then they, the consultant just looks at their RFP. He builds a, a, a workload uh, um, based on the deliverable. Then he looks at what the staff is there and then they, they give a flat fee and that's it. And um, if they take more time to do it, that's on them. If they take less time to do it, that's on you. But that's pretty much the deal on this one. Um, then there's the retainer. So the retainer is when a consultant will, you know, book some part of his time for the client and the client can decide to use it or not. <laughs> but then the, the, the retainer has to be paid. It's very, very suitable for, you know, coaching or sorting board type of services. Um, um, and it's very flexible, but it's usually limited to a very small number of days per month. But there are other models, right? And, uh, and we'll dive into two of them. One is value sharing and the other one is performance based. Hello? Yeah, sorry, I was looking at a, a, a remark. So there, there's um, value sharing is a system where uh, there's a, there, there might be a minimal um, upfront fee our flat fee that is linked to a, very, a larger value sharing fee. Um, for instance, it's very often see, seen in cost uh, cutting project. Uh, you, you'll pay the consultant a small fee and then they will have a share of the, um, the savings they'll be able to, to, uh, to identify and to uh, implement. So that's a way to do things. The, uh, the idea is that it has to be done on things that are easy to measure. Uh, so cost savings, um, um, uh, top line increases and stuff like that, right? The second one is performance based. It's mostly based on KPIs that have been agreed upon at the beginning. <laughs> um, the that can be either simply satisfaction, which is a little bit subjective, or it can be based on a set of KPIs um, that have been decided um, at the beginning of the project. And, uh, and, then, and then depending on the level of the KPI that is attained, then the level of compensation of bonus, if you will, will can be adjusted. Usually in those cases, the initial fee is lower than what you would expect without those fees. Being, but I mean by that is that it's not something on top of the normal fee. It's a way to reduce the initial fee and give potentially more to the consultants afterwards. Um, <laughs> we, we have an example on, on that, that the consultants who would just say, oh, you want performance-based fees, yet let me just give me a bonus on top of, of the rest if you're happy. Now that's not how it works. How it works is that you have a fee of 100 if you do the work in a flat fee. With a performance-based fee, I want the fee to be 80 plus 30 if everything goes well. Meaning that if I don't do things, it's not satisfactory that he'll be paid less. But if it's satisfactory, he might be paid more. That's how you can really get them to do the extra mile because that's what you want usually with those. With those that, that was a that was really a funny conversation. We we asked the consultant, uh, could you please add some performance fees into your proposal? And he said, there is no issue. My price is the same. If you want me to add a performance fee on top, there is absolutely no problem. It was not well received. It was not well received. <laughs> <laughs> it was yeah, absolutely. And so so there are some people in using the, those creative uh, fee structures. The first thing is the ability to define what success does look like. And, and that starts with uh, the baselining uh, and how do you measure the impact of the project on that baseline. And sometimes it's really complicated because 
this not only the project that impacts that design. And that's how do you make sure that this is really focused on that project. So that's the first thing. The first, second thing is that you need to have a risk versus reward balance that is positive. Um, sometimes, and that goes both ways. It's not only for you, it's also for the consultants. If you ask the consultant to start with a zero flat fee and then say, uh, you'll get something at the end if I'm very happy, but the, the reward is not satisfactory or not very high, then they will never engage in that. They will not be interested. You cannot put all the risk on them. But likewise, if the, if the risk they're taking is, you're taking is high, but the reward is limited, maybe it's not, it's not the right solution for you. The third part is that you need to have a very good relationship with the consultants uh, or at least trust them and have transparency because um, you, I'll give you an example actually. Um, there was a, a procurement leader who called me um, last year um, because in her company they had implemented uh, a, pro, a, um, a performance based bonus and uh, they had negotiated and etc and the consultant was very excited and so on and then at the end of the project the consultant sent his invoice with the full price flat fee plus bonus and so the lead the, the procurement uh, leader asked his project manager internally and said hey what happened? Did they get everything? Are they very happy with what they did? And they said, no, no, we just never implemented anything. And, um, and that's probably why they do that. And that you see that not only did the project manager did do that job <laughs> in implementing really and making going through the performance space uh, bonus, but the consultants, they didn't play the game either. And at the end, instead of asking, should I charge everything? They just send directly the invoice. So you see that the relationship was really not good. And you want, don't want to take that risk. And the but last if we, bring this, yeah. if we bring this back to the, 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 the question from uh, the, the central question from this, this, this webinar, it's really about keeping your eyes on the ball and uh, what mm -hmm. drives the impact and making mm -hmm. sure that you have the, the right fee structure to drive toward the impact because maximizing yeah. the impact is, is maximizing your return on investment. Yeah, and that's the last question. Is it, will I get more impact with that fee structure? Are my interests aligned with the consultants? Mm -hmm. That's the only way to really drive more impact and to get really value out of these price, um, pricing structures. If you don't have that, then that's, that's, that's not interesting. You mm -hmm. shouldn't go there. It's too complicated and potentially risky to go there. So, so the the um, the the three elements that can be done is that helping choosing the right pricing model is key, and that requires understanding the the different pricing structures and how they can be used, and you know the pros and cons, the limitation of that. The the second part is ensuring competitive pricing, even though you're using whatever type of fees you're using, ensuring that uh, the fees are, are competitive. And that you're getting, you know, as per industry standard, consultant profile, project complexity, uh, capability, everything, you're getting the right price for that, right, based on the value, right? And, and the last part is setting the target. I mentioned this is really key in those, in those uh, creative fees is how to set the target, how to define the baseline, how to measure the performance. That's super key. And then follow up. <laughs> making sure that you're monitoring progress, that you're ensuring that things are really happening and that the way you structured your payment uh, structure is really implemented in a fair way. And I'm I'm insisting on fair in the sense that sometimes it's not the consultants that are not really behaving, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And then and then that it's aligned with the um, the terms that you have agreed upon. I would I would have one piece of advice on this one is that the acronym that we were using in one of my former companies it's a kiss, it's a keep it super simple, <laughs> because 
uh, if you start engaging in very complex calculations on uh, here is how we will calculate the baseline, there is always something you have not expected that uh, that will impact your calculation. And uh, it's uh, it has to be something simple that that is defendable and that you can calculate uh, without any dispute. Otherwise, it's it's opening the door to a lot of uh, headaches. Absolutely. That was that was it. So uh, I just wanted to finish with uh, some sort of a, a cake takeaway. So first is to focus on what truly matters, uh, and everything else can wait. Um, promote collaboration and maintain uh, clear and consistent communication uh, along the project. Uh, and number three, manage your project really. Um, and then I think that for procurement leaders, what is super important in that is how they can facilitate along the project uh, and, and help secure the impact of those projects. There are many things that can be done by procurement to support the project managers and the, and the key stakeholders in getting the impact they expect from their projects. And on this one, we, we should not forget that this is a triangle. You have the executives, the consultants, and the procurement team. And uh, very often, as someone wrote in the chat, the procurement is pushed on the side or is engaged too late and comes only to negotiate mm -hmm. the contract and so on. But it's a bit like uh, having a seat at the table. You know, you, you don't expect, you don't wait for people to give you a seat at the table. You take it. So uh, yeah. if, you, if you want to have more impact and be more involved and demonstrate that you have value and uh, start being involved and uh, ask the right questions, use the frameworks that Hélène has been, has been presenting, uh, ask simple questions such as, okay, we saw in the questions that 30% of the companies are, have, a, have a steering committee in place, 60% uh, don't. So just proposing to put in place a steering committee is, put, is placing you ahead. Uh, same thing on the make or buy questions or the externalization questions. All those things are little things that, that build credibility. No, and, and to your point, we, we have a, a series of workshops that is starting in end of August. And um, the first the first workshop is August 21st. And it will be about how to get involved earlier <laughs> when buying consulting services. So if you're interested, you can just drop me an email, an email or a, 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 um, a direct message on LinkedIn, and I'd be happy to tell you more about that. Mm -hmm. um, So what is the way to sell this approach to the procurement? Um, so it's it's interesting because um, when we discuss with procurement, they're pretty much saying the other thing. How is How can we sell that to, to our top management? Um, a lot of the things that we, we present are really rooted into sound procurement practices. And, and also a very good understanding of consulting and how those projects unfold. So I'd say that um, the way to sell this approach to procurement is pro probably to get them more um, reading about it so they can really see how it relates to everything they know about procurement. We're not inventing well, we're inventing a couple of things, but we're not, we, we really base that into what was existing already. Laurent, you would want, wanted to add something about? I was just thinking about uh, the one thing that resonates internally is that uh, if you do those things properly, you can probably save 20 to 30% on your cost. And uh, you can increase uh, the impact of your projects uh, almost in the same way. Uh, without even considering the ratio between value and uh, uh, and cost, but uh, from mm -hmm. from an impact standpoint, a project well managed will definitely deliver a higher impact and uh, therefore a, a better return on investment. So there is a there is an immediate payback for all the efforts that are that are being placed on uh, on these kind of topics. No, it's true, and um, and and it's really where you know procurement is a bit lost in where to start. And um, I think that giving them some keys to, you know, hey, you could have a look at this and these frameworks, they could help. That's a good way to show them that there's, there's hope, actually. <laughs> there's hope. Okay. Um, do you think that to be able to buy consulting in the way you describe, you need to have a consulting background first? Um, <laughs> I think it helps. 
uh, it helps to have a consulting background, um, but you know, it doesn't, you don't need to have an extensive background in consulting. Um, I don't personally. I, I think, think it's, more, it's more a matter of a project management experience. Yeah. Uh, I would say that. Than, 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 than consulting. Because at the end, it's, uh, managing a consulting project is it's not very different from managing a, 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 a kind of a, an important internal project. Uh, you need to manage the stakeholders. You need to keep your eyes on the board. You need to make sure that you have clear deliverables and that you're progressing towards this, that you have a governance. Uh, most of those principles are, are can be transposed. No, uh, there, there are a lot of things. There are a lot of things, though, from, uh, that we recommend on the, the procurement of consulting services uh, that are not uh, kind of a, a shoe in uh, with all companies, such as everything that relates to demand management, putting in place control towers, working on the right projects, making sure that you have the right panel, making sure that you work with the right consultants. There are a lot of novel concepts here that require some, uh, some groundwork be, before being able to implement them. But I think that the key really is collaboration. Um, you will not find someone who has at the same time um, the background in procurement at the right level, the understanding of the consulting market, the understanding of consulting project, the understanding of how the company is structured, the influence internally with top leadership. This is, this is getting complicated, right? And so the real key in in, in buying consulting is to have procurement people who know very well their job at you know, procuring uh, intangible services, understanding the complexity of consulting, exploring the market, and then working to build a relationship with the clients who will be the ones who know what they're looking for and what they need, and they have consulting backgrounds actually. And that's how you really make it uh, very efficient. You don't buy procurement as a procurement person. You buy procurement as a, a group or a company. And procurement is here. You buy sorry. You buy consulting as a, a group and a company. And procurement is here to facilitate the process, make sure that the risk is mitigated, that the process is compliant, that all the steps are are taken, and so on. So I have one last question, Hélène. What's what's your next uh, webinar topic? Uh, this is a very good question. Uh, <laughs> let me go to the next uh, you know, slide. So our next webinar will be about, it's been September after a summer break, yeah. And uh, it's gonna be about partnering with your consulting suppliers. Here, we'll be talking about how to build the relationships, how to build your panel, and, and um, how to uh, evaluate the performance and how to develop those long-term relationship with your strategic suppliers. It's typically category management applied to consulting with a kind of a twist because of, of the specific category. Of supplier relationship management, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. If, there, if there are no other questions, um i'll uh, if there if you have other questions i'll be happy to answer them offline uh, you can either send me an email or um and contact me on linkedin and uh, you'll have the recording sent out to you after uh it's processed and you can absolutely download the handouts and um, that's it i wish you a very good end of your day and um and i hope to see you either in the workshop that we're launching end of August or at the next session in September. Thank you. Bye, everyone.